friends i like this theme wander to wander so how many of you here would like to wander how many of you here would like to wander nobody well i can't take you into jungles right now but then i can assure you that i'll get you to ask a lot of good questions and i think you're kind of staring at that title out there trust me i'll answer that over why i refuted iit iim admits but first i'd like to take you through my story when you listen to this theme wander to wander we think of people who refuse to give up but i look at this theme through a different perspective people who kept on changing who kept on evolving who kept on changing until that succeed so i'd like to tell you my small little story over how i continued to evolve friends i have been working towards bringing research to our indian schools now before i get into this topic i'd like to start with a small quiz game for a quiz want to answer some questions let's go back to our school days huh i'll show you six pictures i'll show you all six pictures and you'll have to recognize who they are let's start with an easy question yeah so if you are like rajni kant moving at speeds of light right then you might have to study his physics because newton his apple and his gravitation will no longer work if you are like rajni kant and my next picture absolutely one of the greatest mathematicians and intuitive geniuses to have ever walked on this planet my next picture amartya sen indian economist he conceptualized human development index right we use his invention every day and some of you might be using it right now if you're bored the internet tim berners lee vergis korean right the milkman of india so he was the one who transformed india into the world's largest producer of milk and my next picture anyone green green revolution green revolution correct but who's the person he looks like mr swaminathan or dr swaminathan no right dr norman borlog he is considered the father of green revolution and his research helped in feeding millions of people across the world my question is can we get school students to do this kind of research and probably the answer is a yes and i am going to tell you how i have been trying to do this over the last 5 and 1/2 years my first story i'm going to tell you four stories today and here's my first story this is of a ninth class student called pradeep he was asked this question is group study better or individual study better how many of you study in groups don't lie okay before your exam you're going to take help from your friends right <laughs> yeah so when pradeep was asked this question he decided to answer it not through his opinion and belief but through an experiment he said i'll pick four students and i'll ask them to study as a group i'll pick four students and i'll ask them to study individually and then i'll conduct an assessment to find out which method is more effective then he was asked a question don't you think friends end up forming groups together he said that's a good question generally friends group up together right so he changed his experiment he said i'll take four groups one group of friends will study together one group of enemies will study together one group of friends will study individually and one group of enemies will study individually right and then he'll conduct an assessment to find out whether you should study as a group and with friends or with enemies or should you study as an individual with friends or with enemies so he decided to test his hypothesis with the help of an experiment professor paul bloom of yale university says that 90% of research is all about finding a creative way to test your hypotheses let me give you a simple example can you tickle yourself can you tickle yourself don't try it right now people actually asked this question and they even invented a tickling machine okay to try and find out if you can tickle yourself it was a, like a set of motors which can you know tickle you but till today they couldn't uh, you know find out because you're kind of conscious right 
So if one of you can think of an experiment to find out if people can tickle themselves, then I'm sure you can have a very good research paper written around it. But this is one of the interesting areas I work on to help students in thinking of an experiment to find out answers rather than basing your claims on opinion or beliefs. Because for all you know, opinions and beliefs could be flawed. And friends, before I get into my talk, let me tell you, I have a very powerful message waiting for you at the end of my talk. I have a very powerful message waiting for you. And then, if you talk to my students, they'll tell you, I'm very good at keeping suspense. So let me run into my next story. So this wonder kid, Einstein, the one on the right, his name is Einstein. Uh, he's been appropriately named so. He's studying in class seven right now. And he was participating in an entrepreneurship competition for college students. Uh, this competition's name was Hack Your MVP. MVP stands for Minimum Viable Product. So it's like the small little thing which you build and show to your investors to prove that your concept is going to work. And Einstein came out with a very interesting idea. He said he'll build a software which will help you play latest computer games on old computers. How many of you have problems with playing latest computer games here? Old computers, right? Mm -hmm. Einstein had the same problem. So he decided to build a startup around this idea. And the most exciting bit about his idea was that he would promote his idea with the help of YouTubers. As you know, YouTubers are people who make their living just out of uploading videos out there. They earn a living by uploading videos. Then Einstein was asked, why is it that you're only getting onto YouTube? Then Einstein said, see, these computer gamers don't have time, okay? They don't have time for uh, the TV, they don't have time for newspapers, they're on the PC all the time. So my best bet is YouTube. He was then asked, what if the YouTubers feel that your product is hopeless? He said, that's good, no? I'll get to know why my product is bad and I'll correct it. He was then asked, what if, I mean, why should these people even write about your or talk about your idea? He said, if they talk about my idea, they're going to get more views and I'm going to get publicity. They win, I win. They make money, I get publicity. Then the judges came in and asked, what if your YouTube idea fails? He said, I'll try two or three other websites. Then he was asked, why don't you try two or three other websites right from the beginning? Why put all your eggs into the same basket? He said, no, I'll first build a very strong foundation. And once my foundation through YouTube is strong, then I'll maybe get into Facebook or something else. The idea is initially, I'll unite all my energies into building one thing. And friends, this was a seventh class student who was talking of focus as a business strategy. If Steve Jobs was alive and had he come to JNT on that day, he would have been proud of this kid for talking of focus. And this definitely left the judges baffled over how school students were talking about entrepreneurship. And I asked one of my students, how did this actually happen? I mean, seventh class student is talking about entrepreneurship and talking about business strategy. So my student, Meenakshi tells me, she's a 11th class student at HPS Begum Pate, And she tells me that two aspects of this workshop which help the students. Point number one, the objective of the program is very clearly defined. And once the objective is very clearly defined, the student gets interested in solving this research problem. And point number two, the students are given very intuitive and easy examples. We had discussed business models of ice cream shops, of computer games, and so students were able to apply these concepts. So this experience made me believe that research is possible at school level, provided you do it in the right way. And now I'm moving to my third story. This is about how I'm teaching history in one of my class. How many of you felt history to be the most boring topic at school? Right? Boring topic? My students don't call it boring, okay? Let me see, let, let, let me tell you why. So, in fact, I was looking up Stanford History Education Group. They have published on their website some ideas to make history education more inquiry-based, more question-based. So I walked into this school called Tejashvi Vidyaranya, and I was to teach my students history. 
So I asked them, pick the most boring topic possible and I'll make it interesting for you. And trust me, I don't know history. I walked in there and they said 18th century political developments. I didn't know what it meant. And they said this topic on Awadh is really boring. So it turns out uh, in this period, Mughal Empire was ruling over Awadh and there was this guy called Burhan Ul Mulk Sadat Khan who was a governor. Trust me, his name is as scary to you as it is to me. So let me call him Sadat Khan for a while. So then I asked my students, can you think of a question from your textbook? Because I didn't read the textbook, right? So I asked them to ask me some questions. So this boy Einstein, again the same guy, he asked me a question. Who was the weakest person in Awadh during the Mughal rule? Students came out with a lot of answers. They said Jagirdars, Mahajans, farmers and so on. But then this boy called Adit, he says Mughal emperor was the weakest. Einstein was like, what are you talking? Mughal emperor is the weakest. The emperor of India is the weakest. What are you talking? That's what he said. Then Adit was like, of course, because Sadat Khan removed all the Mughal Jagirdars and appointed his own Jagirdars there. Einstein was like, come on, just because the Mughal emperor is not aware, all of this had happened. If the Mughal emperor was aware, both your Sadat Khan and his Jagirdars would just be removed. Then Adit had an immediate counter. He had an immediate counter. He said, even if he gets to know, what will he do? He's facing Nadir Shah invasion right now. Read the textbook. Then Einstein, clearly unhappy. Acha counter mila. He was very unhappy. He was like, it's okay. The emperor could be busy, but the relatives of the emperor can solve the problem, right? Adit spontaneously had said, the relatives of the Mughal emperor were being killed by the Jagirdars, which is precisely why the Mughal Empire was getting weakened in the 18th century. Read the textbook again. So, friends, I mean, when you go back to your school time, right, we had so many facts in a textbook. We often wondered, why is it that we're being tortured with all these facts? I'll forget them anyway. But point is, when you use this technique, students appreciate those facts, they understand why they're being taught, and by the way, this technique is called the Socratic Dialogue. The legendary philosopher Socrates had thought of this concept. And uh, at the beginning of this event, they spoke of Alexander. By the way, Alexander was taught by Aristotle. Aristotle was taught by Plato. And Plato was taught by Socrates. So I think Alexander was the grand student of Socrates. And he was taught in the same method which I'm explaining you right now. So if this method can produce a world conqueror Alexander, we better try this method, right? So, what this method does is, this method will help you in looking at more perspectives, more ways of looking at something, and also about probing those perspectives more intensively. And this will make sure, no matter what career the student is going to choose after education, the curriculum topics will be useful to students. You'll be able to imbibe life skills into the student over the curriculum topic. Let me give you one final example before I move into my story. So, I was teaching this chapter on Raja Raja Chola. So a student asked me, why did Raja Raja Chola build all those massive temples? Somebody said he would get donations. Somebody said his name and fame would spread so people, soldiers would fight for him in a very patriotic manner. Something like Bahubali, right? Jai Mahishmati and all of that. So, then I tried to connect this with the 21st century context. I said, I asked them a question. Would you be more willing to fight for your king or for your god? They said, I'll be more willing to fight for my god. So I connected it to the 21st century. I said, let's say after finishing your education, you are going to work on your startup and you have to attract talent to work for you. You don't have much of funds because you're a startup. So what will you tell people? They came out with answers like work for India, you're a friend, work for me and all of that. Then I gave them a hint. What if your startup is around cricket? They said, let's do it for cricket because we all love cricket. I said, precisely, sell your vision and values and not yourself. And that's how Steve Jobs managed to get the planet's best designers and engineers to work for him, right? And friends, when I look at this connection of history to present day business, of how, you know, the idea of selling vision and values helps you, 
When you think about it, this is not very different from my own story. When I began at the age of 16, I started teaching at the age of 16. Since then, I've had amazing support from a lot of people. And that is probably because they liked my idea of bringing in research into a school level, of evolving our education system. You see, right, the kids are quite happy out there. So this helped me get a lot of opportunities. People were willing to believe that I can get school students to do research, school students to do research and give advice to state government and central government on how our policy should be. And there you see Mr. Sujeev Nair of Task listening to a student's presentation. It doesn't end there. My next big thing was extrapolate. I was fortunately supported by Central Bookshop and we could prove that school students can give advice to principals, bureaucrats, and all the thought leaders about how our education system should be. And all of this was not their opinion. It was not their opinion, it was not their belief. They had pie charts, they had solid data, they conducted experiments in their classroom. They were like, I have experimental evidence. If you want, I'll come to your school, I'll conduct this experiment in your school, and I'll prove you that my technique will work. School students did research and proved how they can improve our education system. And I was also fortunate to have done a lot of educator evolution programs at some of the finest schools of Hyderabad to bring in that research orientation into our classrooms. And here, I would like to come back and answer my question because I'm out of time. In 2009, I had rejected the great Indian dream the Indian Institute of Technology. I had an admit at IIT Roorkee, but I rejected it to choose ICER Pune, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. It was only a startup institute. I was in the fourth batch. And this was a great experiment by Indian government to try and bring research down to college level, because generally research starts at PhD level, right? And the best part about this was, generally we complain that uh, our curriculum is outdated, right? 20 years back, things are being taught to us and all of that. But my problem was, we were not even taught the present. We were not even taught the present. What our faculty were teaching in our classroom would probably be published by them in a peer-reviewed journal six months later. Our institute's tagline was where tomorrow's science begins today. Excited by this, I thought, how about starting research at school level itself? And this excitement took me to such an extent that I eventually rejected the next big Indian dream, Indian Institute of Management. In fact, I went into my interview with a kurta and jeans, and that was the last question they asked me in my interview, and they loved my answer. In fact, they loved my story, whatever I had presented to them. So what I'd like to tell you guys, I think I promised you a very powerful message, right? But the point is I don't believe in messages, okay? So, but I still have to give you a message, right? So let me tell you guys, I'm sure all of you are wanderers here. And whenever a wanderer, whenever a wanderer is confronted by a problem, whenever a huge problem hits a wanderer, a wanderer is like this, right? Like what? Ask your inner voice, it'll tell you. And I am not going to tell you right now, because the most powerful way of telling something is to not tell something. Thank you guys. May the force of evolution be with you. So keep evolving, keep questioning. Thank you guys. <laughs>